Um, thank you for that kind introduction. So today I'm going to tell you about our recent work to help improve support for victims of intimate partner violence, or IPV. I should note that some of the content of this talk can be emotionally distressing, but it is important to discuss, and I hope to leave you all feeling encouraged by the opportunities that exist for us as technologists to help people. Let me start by telling you a story. It's made up for privacy reasons, but it is representative of situations that IPV victims experience with technology abuse. Carol filed for divorce from her husband after years of his abuse. She saw a receipt on their joint credit card statement that he bought an application named MSpy, which she looked up and learned it could get her location, messages, and take pictures of her secretly. She didn't know if it was installed on her phone or not, but he keeps showing up at places that she goes and follows her. To make matters more complicated, Carol realized that he also hacked her Facebook account. He logged into it to pose as Carol, and he used it to send non-consensual intimate images of her to her boss. Carol re responded by changing her Facebook password, which made her ex-husband really angry, and he forced her to tell him the new password and he threatened her with physical violence if she tried changing it again. This threat escalation made it impossible for Carol to keep control over her account. Then, after their divorce, Carol's ex-husband received joint custody over their child. When the child is visiting him, he has direct access to the child's tablet, which is syncing images and apps with Carol's phone. Carol doesn't realize it, but this access to the child's tablet is how her ex is getting her pictures. So not every IPV situation involves this much technology abuse, but many do. And in our work with survivors, we encounter situations like Carol's routinely. For context, IPV is very widespread, and prior work highlights the types of harms that we have heard about in Carol's situation and finds that they arise in a large fraction of cases that people have heard about. But one thing to note is that these types of tech abuse aren't only complicated problems in aggregate, but also in individual situations, such as Carol's, which are already complicated in the amount and the ways that technology is used against her. Given all of this, the question is, how can we help victims like Carol? As technologists, our first inclination might be to try to fix various software flows and designs that exacerbate tech abuse like victims being locked out of their accounts by abusers. But it would be naive to think that improvements to technology would completely mitigate tech abuse for someone like Carol. To help victims in the short term, we need socio-technological interventions. To add perspective to this thought, let's take a look at the current state of help someone like Carol could find for her tech abuse situation. In New York City, we're fortunate to have a municipal government organization called the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, or NGBV, which runs what are called Family Justice Centers, or FJCs, in each of the five boroughs of the city. These Family Justice Centers provide direct services to victims who in this context are called clients. For example, clients might be referred to lawyers for ongoing criminal cases against their abuser, receive help with transitional housing, and more. In my group's prior work, Freed et al. investigated this ecosystem in detail and found, among other things, that there are currently no services available to help victims with their tech abuse. Their caseworkers and lawyers are doing their best to help, but they reported a lack of expertise in navigating this abuse with the client. One thing we should be doing is helping improve training for these advocates in order to help them help their clients with tech abuse. But for situations like Carol's, which are not uncommon, we feel that there is an unmet need for additional computer security and privacy expertise. And so we would like to expand the existing ecosystem to help victims navigate more complicated tech abuse. In this paper, we propose a new idea called clinical computer security, where a client like Carol can meet face-to-face -face with an IPV tech consultant. This is a new role we are defining, which requires expertise in both technology and computer security, but also training to do client-centered advocacy. 
our vision is that Carol could talk to such an IPV tech consultant about her technology concerns and receive help that is sensitive to the context of IPV. However, professional roles for navigating tech abuse, according to this vision, don't exist. So part of the research challenge in this setting is discovering evidence-based best practices for clinical security. So we're taking a first step towards realizing what it means to have a good clinical security practice. We designed a first of its kind protocol for meeting with victims and deploying IPV tech consultants. This includes new tools and procedures to check privacy and security configurations on victims' digital accounts, scanning their mobile devices for spyware applications, and integrating safety planning into tech abuse decision making. To evaluate our model, we have been running a field study in partnership with the NGBV since November 2018, where trained members of our team meet with victims in this new role of an IPV tech consultant. In the paper, we report on helping 44 clients. Before I describe our protocol and results in more detail, it's important to discuss our methodology. Because victims of IPV are a highly vulnerable population, and we wouldn't want our research to cause any harm. We therefore took many steps to ensure our research was as safe as possible for clients. First, we partnered with the NGBV to conduct the field study on site at family justice centers whose staff are trained professionals in working with IPV victims. Of course, we received IRB approval for all of our research, but we additionally took an iterative stakeholder guided approach to our protocol design. We first conducted a series of focus groups in which we met with a total of 56 IPV professionals to elicit feedback on our protocol design, including lawyers, case managers, NGBV leadership, NYPD, and other advocates. We ended up going through nine rounds of changes on our prototypes as a result, at which point we went through an additional review process with the NGBV leadership. They concluded that our research would be beneficial to their clients and that our safety procedures were sufficient. Only then did we run our field study with the clients. So now I'll present more details on our final protocol that we deployed and then report on the field study. The clients we meet with first receive referrals from their case manager, lawyer, or other advocate to meet with us. After our consultation is complete, we refer them back to their advocate who serves an important role in ensuring that the client can conduct what is called safety planning as a result of discoveries made during our consultation. For instance, recall that in Carol's story, her abuser threatened her with physical violence should she change her Facebook password in the future. So she and her advocate would need to decide whether it is safe for her to change any vulnerable passwords we discover given her current situation. During the actual consultation, there are three phases. Understand, investigate, and advise. I'm going to discuss each of these in turn, and I'm going to use Carol as a running example for why we did procedures the way that we did. Recall that Carol's story is really complex. The three phases of the consultation are aimed at helping the tech consultant understand these issues, investigate what the potential root causes are, and help advise her about what options she has to improve her computer security. As I said, I'll be using her story as a running example as if we had done a consultation with her. So we start by trying to understand Carol's situation and tech problems via a semi-structured interview format where we begin by asking her what her chief tech concerns are and letting the conversation go from there. This might sound like it should be easy, but it turns out that these tech problems can become very complicated. In Carol's case, there were issues with her being hacked and impersonated on Facebook. There is uncertainty of how her ex-husband got access to her pictures, concerns about spyware, and so forth. In order to tease apart all of these issues, we created the Technology Assessment Questionnaire, or TAC, to help guide the tech consultant cover high-level important questions that probe for such compromises. We also created what we call the Technograph, a tool to be used by the IPV tech consultant to diagrammatically map out the nuanced relationships between the various people, devices, and accounts that are related to Carol's tech abuse. The Technograph can help the consultant visualize these relationships and spot potential issues such as accounts with passwords that the abuser can guess, which in Carol's case could explain how her Facebook was originally hacked. 
by the end of this phase, the consultant should have a better understanding of all the aspects of tech abuse that a client like Carol is experiencing. Then the consultation proceeds to the next phase, investigate, to try to get to the bottom of her chief concerns. This phase involves two kinds of investigations. One is programmatic tool-based investigations, and the other is manual security and privacy checkups. We start with programmatic investigations, and it is important to note that we ask the client for permission to use their device and navigate their accounts, and we actively involve them in the process. Remember in Carol's story that she saw a receipt for mSpy on her joint bank account with her ex-husband. And so our understand phase would have surfaced a concern of spyware being installed on her devices. In fact, prior work by my group did a measurement study that showed that there are a wealth of spyware tools out there that are easy for abusers to download and install on a victim's device. And that work showed that existing anti-spyware tools are ineffective at finding them. So we needed to create a whole new tool for finding spyware, which we call ISD. ISD queries the device over USB to get a list of apps installed on it. ISD then checks that list against its own blacklist, and it uses additional heuristics to check whether the device is rooted or jailbroken, and runs a simple regex check for words like spy or track in the title and app ID for apps that uh, are on the device that aren't on our blacklist. We also took great care to ensure that ISD was safe for victims of IPB. It does not collect any personal data. It does not install anything on the scan device. And we confirmed that popular spyware apps don't detect the use of ISD. When we, when we scanned Carol's phone, we found no spyware, but she noted that she obtained a new phone after leaving her ex-husband. We therefore turned to Carol's accounts for manual investigation. Remember that aside from spyware, Carol had concerns about continued access to her Facebook account by her abuser, as well as concerns about her location being tracked and family sharing between her phone and her son's tablet. In order to investigate these issues, we manually navigate to the relevant security and privacy settings for apps the client is concerned about. An added bonus is that this process often turns into impromptu security trainings where we show the client how to find the relevant interfaces and what their features mean. Actually, it turns out that remembering how to navigate through all of these security and privacy settings is difficult, even for a security expert, because there are so many products out there. So we developed a set of cribs for the tech consultant to find the relevant interfaces on popular platforms like Google, iCloud, and Facebook. For Carol, this part of the investigation would reveal that she is using family sharing with her child, which, coupled with our knowledge gleaned during the understand phase that her ex-husband had access to the child's tablet, we surface a plausible explanation for how her photos were obtained without her consent. Now that we have investigated Carol's devices and accounts and found possible causes of some of her chief concerns, we can turn to discussing the situation with her. First, we summarized the findings so far of our consultation, recapping the concerns that Carol shared with us and the issues that we uncovered. In Carol's case, we didn't find spyware on her current phone, but we did uncover the issue of her child's tablet syncing images with her phone that are then accessible by her ex-husband during visitation. While at this point, it might be tempting to tell Carol to shut off family sharing, Remember that she faced the risk of escalation of physical violence for changing her Facebook password. So an important aspect of our consultation is that we take a client-centered approach, which means that Carol is considered the expert on her situation. And the role of the consultant is to empower her with information she can use to make the best decisions for herself, for her security, with the help of her referring professional. When issues are discovered, we get in touch with Carol's case manager to conduct safety planning where we enter a three-way discussion of the risks of making changes uh, poses to Carol's safety. And only after completing such an assessment are we able to assist her with the changes that she feels safe making, uh, like turning off family sharing. So our overall clinical design was refined from the feedback of over 50 IPV professionals, but we wanted to see how it would go with actual clients. So we began an ongoing field study with the NGBV and advertised the study to IPV professionals who referred clients to us. In the paper, we reported on consultations with 44 clients, in total scanning 75 devices, 
identifying many cases of unwanted logins, potential password compromise, and for three clients, potential spyware. We reassured many clients as well about the lack of tech problems. The field study is ongoing, and we have continued to observe the same kinds of tech abuse issues as reported in the paper. All of this begs the question of how to evaluate whether this consultation model improves outcomes for clients. We have seen encouraging signs that our consultations are valuable to clients. The NGBV practitioners are really excited about our work and definitely want us to keep doing it. We have lots of data from this study. And in a complimentary paper that will appear at CSCW later this year, we analyzed a lot of hours worth of transcripts from consultations uh, with clients' permission to record, finding that many of the clients reacted positively to our consultation, expressing feelings of validation, reassurance, and empowerment about their tech concerns, and expressing interest in learning more about security and privacy and tech more generally. So to recap, we introduced a new idea called Cl Clinical Computer Security and piloted a first-of-its-kind field study with the New York City Mayor's Office to end domestic and gender-based violence. And we created new tools and procedures along the way. Our field study has raised a host of questions for future work, including outcome measurements of our clinics, developing a set of best practices for including forensics into the clinical model, and adapting the model for other at-risk groups such as elder and child abuse in the context of domestic violence, journalists, refugees, dissidents, uh, and more. Uh, thank you. I will now take questions. Hi. Uh, Hi. Tar Tarek Yosef from Google. Um, so one of the, uh, first of all, thank you for doing this work. This is very, very important. Um, one of the big things that I was thinking about is with the increase in um, third party like IoT um, devices, like especially mm -hmm. in smart home environments, um, was there anything that you noticed in terms of an effective way to say evaluate that for clients um, or perhaps uh, any unique challenges that you found here? Yes, so uh, the question is uh, with IoT devices, what does that look like in our consultations? And uh, the tricky part is these clients are meeting with us face to face and some of them will bring their devices in with them. Um, for instance, they'll bring in Amazon Echoes, they'll bring in gaming consoles, uh, they'll bring in uh, fire alarms that they suspect have hidden cameras in them, all sorts of devices from their homes. And for us, the challenge is, uh, given the plethora of all these different kinds of uh, IoT devices, how can we create protocols that cover all of them? And the answer isn't straightforward. It's like, we need to be able to uh, take these case by case. And so, um, for instance, one challenge with like an Amazon Echo is that uh, if the abusive partner registered it in their name, Amazon doesn't allow you to deregister that device at all. You need to buy a new device. Um, and so we've had concerns before about can you still, are these devices, are you able to repossess them and wipe them or are they still always tied to your abuser? Uh, and so, yeah, that's definitely an active challenge. Yeah. Hi, Christina Anita Rotaru, Northeastern University. Uh, thank you very much for your work. Um, I was looking at the ongoing and open questions, and one of the items that I don't see on the list, and I was curious if you thought about it, is educating and empowering the victims. Yes. A few of the things that you mentioned seem to pretty much be the same. Uh, so I was thinking that at least some of them, you know, maybe working with the mayor's office or this organization, you can have some educational. Yeah, um, so it's interesting because when we meet with victims, uh, often what, everything that we're doing, we try to actively involve them in. So we'll explain to them what we're doing as we're doing it. Like as we're navigating their devices, we explain like what our spyware scan is doing. They'll generally ask us questions about how they can improve their computer security. And um, one of the benefits there is that a lot of them have, uh, uh, many of them have reported feeling like, you know, I've learned something from this. Um, but there's definitely a bigger question there of like, how can we effectively uh, educate people? Um, and so there are uh, like online movements that try to tackle these sorts of things, but uh, uh, more research is definitely needed there. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sam.